You know, I just want to take my hat off to the boldest, the men and women of the Department of Correction. As long as I can remember my time in law enforcement, this has been an agency that has been ignored, has been an agency that every day, in spite of all of the uh, negative news, they come every day, they do the job, they hold it down. And they have been calling out for years of saying, we need help, we need help, we need help. And the problems that they have been facing did not start in 2022. In fact, it has started generations ago. But what we're seeing, the erosion of our correctional facility is a complete neglect of the men and women who serve here every day. They come in, they deal with some of the most dangerous people in our city. When a person commits a crime, a homicide, a rape, a robbery, they, not, they do not go back to their block. They go back to a cell block. And they have to ensure that person does not harm another inmate, harm a staff, or in some cases harm themselves. And instead of us lifting them up, we do just the opposite. We tear them down over and over again. But I'm here to say to the men and women of the Department of Corrections, this mayor is not going to tear you down. I acknowledge your job, I acknowledge what you do, and I'm saying thank you for what you do. The job you are doing, people don't want to do. Yet you do it every day. And as I walked through the facilities and saw how you are continuing to evolve, I'm more solid in my belief we pick the right person to be the commissioner of the Department of Correction. And I want to thank Commissioner Molina. This administration has gone through so many challenges since January, from fires to loss of officers to violence, to COVID, to economic strife, our economy. But the crisis we're facing here is one of our largest crises. And we could easily throw up our hands and say, uh, let the federal government take over. We could have easily done that. But no, we know we are better than that. We know that we can fix this problem. And all we ask is to give us the opportunity and the resources to carry out this function and for all of our partners to do their job, unbottlenecking the court system, making sure those who are committing crimes are going through the process and having laws that not only protect citizens, protect those who are carrying out the job of protecting us. And we do want to acknowledge the recent deaths in the Department of Correction. But let's look at each individual death and find out what happened. <laughs> It blew my mind to learn out of 5,000 prisoners, they have over 140-something thousand cases of people getting medical treatment. Think about that number. By the time they get here, their pre-existing conditions, their health crises, mental health illnesses, all of the things that people are facing at the worst end of their lives are discovered when they come here. 5,000 people, over 140,000 medical interactions. That's an amazing number to look at and examine. I saw that today as I walked through and talked to people in custody and in correction, some of the young people who are in the Peace Center, how they wanted to sit down and say, we want to interact to learn more. I'll be back here to sit down and speak with many of them. I can learn so much from the inmates that are going to be returning home. I was here uh, last week, I believe, uh, at a graduation ceremony. You know, I don't, it probably was last week. You know, when you're the mayor, my life is like a dog life. One day is many days. And seeing these graduates and touched by uh, the principal of the school, of watching all these layers of these officers and what they're doing. Walking through uh, the first facility with the warden, you can genuinely care. I see she cares. I mean, these officers, they care about these inmates. 
and ensuring that they can get something out of here instead of doing time that they can learn during this time so they don't continue to work. And we know that we're not where we want to be. It's a lot of work in progress, a lot that we have to do. But at the heart of that is doing something that must be done, keeping our place safe. It starts with this. Look at this. This is only an example. This is an example of what they retreat. Look at these pieces. Look at these shanks. This is what they come to work to experience every day. The weapons you see in front of you are small samples of 2,700 different weapons. We were able to recover these rep weapons because Commissioner Molina came in and resumed the tactical search operation that had been previously suspended. We stopped the tactical search operation that allows us to retrieve this because those who are not protecting inmates would allow this. And so, as politicians normally do, they succumb to the loudest and say, we're going to stop doing these searches and allow people from the time we suspended to carry these weapons. Not me. <laughs> Ignore the noise and get the job done. And I thank the units that carried out this function. And because of not only the search procedure, many people talk about the officers that are out. How about focusing on 1,400 officers returned to work under the leadership of Commissioner Molina and his team? They're back. And those who are out legitimately, they have a right, if they're injured and now sick, to be out. Those who are abusing the right to be out, we're going to focus on them. But that is not the entire population that is out. Some have been injured, attacked, out sick from COVID for a long time. Rikers were, were, was ignored when people were asking for masks, PPEs, and other resources. We ignored Rikers Island. And some people have legitimate reasons that they are out. And we will distinguish between the two. You see that a lot of these have weapons that you have in front of you are made from plexiglass and other building materials taken from the jails themselves. So people use the eroding facilities as to become a weapon factory to attack other inmates and officers. The number is often ignored that over 80 percent of the attacks here are on other inmates. Those who are dangerous don't stop being dangerous because they come to Rikers. They continue to be dangerous. And I'm here to tell you that the era of neglecting our jails for a political reason, that era sunsetted on January 1st, 2022, when I became the mayor of this city. We're going to be focused and not going to let people wander the streets of our city with dangerous weapons like these, and they can't do it on Rikers Island. Tactical search operations work, and we're going to continue to do them. Since we resumed tactical search operation in February, slashings and stabbings have declined by 63%. <laughs> so when you saw those slashings and stabbings going up, they suspended the searches. And we have ex-commissioners that are criticizing this commissioner. What did you do when you had the job? You telling us everything we're doing wrong, what did you do right? We decreased slashes by 63%. Assaults on staff resulting in use of force are down 30% compared to the same six months of the period last year. Use of force is down 27% as compared to the same six month period last year. This is proof right leadership can turn the corner and we have the right leadership in Commissioner Molina. We're seeing progress, and it's not only that we're saying we're seeing progress, the federal judge said it. <laughs> he said we're moving in the right direction, and we have the right leadership. That's what the federal judge said. So everyone was calling, 
take Rikers away, take Rikers away, an independent person that viewed our plan and our operation and our progress stated they are doing the right things to move it in the right direction, and we're going to continue to do, do that. We're seeing progress, and that progress is going to continue to materialize. The plan includes an intra-agency task force designed to give our jails the support they need and stop having the boldest do this on their own. Rikers is all of our responsibility. The Department of Education, probation, housing, all of us are responsible for what happens here on Rikers Island. And that is what we're saying to our city. We will hold people who possess weapons and contrabands and commit crimes in our jails. They will be held accountable. Since January 1st, we have rearrested 121 people in custody for crimes committed. And I want to thank Darcel Clark, the Bronx District Attorney, for being a partner on this. Rikers Island has become a way station, not the last stop. And we know that. We must give people the protection of the law as we enforce the law. And enforcing the law is not only on our streets, it's inside our facilities that we're housing those who have committed crime or accused of committing a crime. We must do more, and we know that, and we will continue to do more. And we are focused on the root causes of crime. That is why we want schools, graduation, walked into one facility where they're teaching welding and how to be a mechanic. We don't want these young people and adults to continue to come back into our society. That is the holistic approach that we are facing and what we're doing. You heard me say it over and over again. There are many rivers that feed the sea of violence. We have to dam each one of them. This commissioner is doing his job of damming the rivers that allow people to return to violence. And that includes those who are here with learning disabilities. First mayor in history that we will be testing inmates for dyslexia. It is predicted 30 to 40 percent of the inmates here are dyslexic. And we're not waiting until they come back home. We're testing them here in Rikers to give them the support that they need. I am truly pleased of what I am seeing and what I saw today. And I will be back here over and over again to make sure that this is part of our overall plan of supporting these men and women. This is one of the toughest jobs in this city, if not the toughest job in America. These officers were doing 12-hour tours. They were doing triples, <laughs> triples, not seeing their families. And every day they pick up the paper and they hear how bad they are, how we treated Rikers Island and the men and women who are here, we should all be ashamed of that. And it doesn't lose sight on me. Look here, predominantly black and brown. Who are the enemy? inmates? Predominantly black and brown. Overwhelming number of predominantly women in a dangerous, in a dangerous environment. Got to think about that for a moment. I see it, and I know it. And I'm saying to you, you're the boldest, and you're one of the best law enforcement entities we have in this country. I thank you for doing your job and doing this life-saving work. And this is a mayor that acknowledges you. And I am not ashamed of you. I am proud of you. Keep doing the job you're doing, and we're going to be there to do it with you. Commissioner. Mr. Mayor, thank you for your continued leadership and support of this department. I want to thank our uniformed staff. Um, without, their, without their support and dedication to their jobs, what you see before you couldn't have been done. Not only did we seize over 2,700 contraband weapons, but we also seized over 400 different types of drug paraphernalia and narcotics that tries to get into our facilities. So every day our men and women in uniform are doing everything they can to make this place safe. And they're led by the men and women you see behind me, our wardens and acting assistant chiefs, in order to be able to get this work done. But in addition to our uniform staff, I want to also shout out our non-uniform staff. Our program staff and our contract providers are engaging with the people in custody, 
are credible messengers. It is a holistic approach in order to get individuals not to respond violently to issues of conflict. And I also want to thank our faith-based leaders. We've increased our interaction with our faith-based community so that they're in here and they're interacting with persons in custody, but they're also interacting with our staff too because this work is not easy. So thank you for coming today and, and, and giving us an opportunity to share with a lot of the work that we have done here to make progress today. Let me stay here. If any questions on topic. member had raised some questions about the conditions in EMTC and in intake, saying there were plenty of men, I believe, around the facility, that people were screaming, people were urinating. Uh, is that the kind of conditions that you saw? First, let's do with the first level. You said uh, seven people have died. Three people have died. In the last right, so we should look into each death. Because if you have pre-existing conditions, remember, 5,000 people, over 140 thousand hospital rooms or medical uh, procedures from dental to other procedures. By the time people reach Rikers, their health has, de has, it has deteriorated and they come to these facilities. Now, you telling me, Eric, three people were stabbed, three people were murdered. Now we're talking about a different conversation. So let's look at each individual and find out out of those 5,000 people, three, uh, die. Let's find out why did they die? Because Rikers didn't give them heart disease if that's the reason they died. Rikers didn't give them di diabetes if that was, that's the reason they died. We look at the number, hey, three people died, but why did they die? You know, what conditions did they have before they came to Rikers Island? The headline does not tell the story. We walk through the intake area, and when you see the large number of people who are coming in, and those who are uh, leaving, when you see that combination, and we continue to involve to get the product that we want, uh, speaking with the uh, warden that was over there, it was clear of her focus on what's, what needs to be done. She has a, a uh, I believe it's a 89% or high level of those who receive the necessary medical treatment that they deserve, and getting people to the facilities that they need. A uh, commission may want to talk about the intake. So, I mean, so we, we've made a lot of vast improvement in our intake, especially since the situation as it was pertaining to last year. So we're moving a lot of individuals in. Just to put it into context, calendar year to date, we've had over 8,900 admissions that have gone through that intake facility. Um, so we're managing and we're blending um, housing units and we're making sure that we're allowing people to receive the medical care that they need in a timely fashion so that they can be placed in other facilities in the island. You know what, Courtney, which, 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 what I learned, which, which was like a, an awakening for me as I walked through, we often think of uh, hospitalization, 140,000 people or uh, medical treatment. We also think of people intake and outtake. We think of this as, okay, we just have a smooth transition of moving bodies around. No, you're moving dangerous people around. <laughs> they, this is not just, um, okay, you're at Walmart and you're online, we're gonna move you to the next cashier. No, you have to be very careful, very strategic, and always be focused on, I have a dangerous person that committed a violent crime. Because to get here, it's not that you shoplift. It's not that you stole a bicycle, because you're going home from the precinct. To get here, you created, you, you committed a dangerous crime. And they have to stay focused as they meticulously move people from one location to the other. They have to lock down areas. They have to take prisoners moving. They have to be on their pews, P's, and Q's. This is not just moving bodies around. This is moving some of the most dangerous people in our city around. And there's an art to do it, to do it correctly. And that's what they're doing. Steve? Mr. Mayor? Yes. Um, Looking at this, you know, the immediate question that comes to mind is what is the condition of this facility that allows inmates to fashion a, a piece of plexiglass and break it apart and turn it into a weapon? And second question, is it still a top priority moving as quickly as possible to close this complex entirely? Second question first. We're going to follow the law. 
The law states uh, that Rikers could no longer be a jail. In my opinion, it does not matter. That's the law. And I'm going to always follow the law. Uh, shanks are not new. Shanks are not only in Rikers. Shanks and, and, and the ingenuity of creating weapons is probably as old as prisons have, uh, have been. The, using the eroding, erosion of this facility to create weapons and the creativity of those who want to do harm in prisons is not a new phenomenon. You know, as long as I can remember and every time I visit a correctional facility I'm from Attica, um, off the coast of San Francisco, you see the same things. But the ability to be strategic and go in and find them, remove them, and hold people accountable is what we stopped doing over the last couple of years because of outside noise. That noise has been shut off. This commissioner is going to have the complete trust in me to do this job, and that's why we retrieved 2,700 weapons that could have harmed an inmate or a member of, the, of this facility. Yes, uh, for the commissioner, could you describe your tactical search operation? What does that involve, and um, what do the officers do? Sure, so it's leveraging um, not only security staff that works within the facility, working with the warden, they're working in coordination on their acting assistant chief of security, we use special search teams, special response teams, as well as our emergency service units, and we go to the various housing units, and we search um, individuals' property, we search cells, we search individuals, um, and we remove contraband weapons or contraband narcotics that are in these facilities. Are they hidden strategically? Where, where do you find them? So um, we find them sometimes in, in cell areas, sometimes we may find them in, in corridors, sometimes we may find them on individual people as we're searching individuals randomly. Um, we also do a lot of interdiction. Um, stuff sometimes comes through the mail as well, or sometimes when visitors are coming in. Um, that's not specifically to our tactical search operations, but it speaks holistically of what we're doing in order to make sure that we see anything that may enter our facilities that can put people in danger. You know, I remember, I remember, you know, um, West 4th Street as a transit cop, this guy was a, um, uh, just get, came home, and he showed me a, I don't know if you want to call it a trick or whatever, but he said, search my mouth. And I looked at his mouth all around, looked at his gums all around. He said, do I have anything? And I said, no. He said, <laughs> he pulled out a razor. The creativity to harm people is what they deal with every day. Where they secrete weapons is beyond your imagination. And you can use your imagination. <laughs> because nothing is off limits. And that's what they're up against every day. John? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, so our reporting shows that two of the deaths, one was an overdose and the other a man hung himself. And it looks as if staffing shortages may have kind of exacerbated the damage they were able to do to themselves. In terms of the staff that are not here, what are you going to do to bring them back and make sure that posts are staffed appropriately? So that something like that does not happen. Well, uh, number one, uh, you, any death is a death we think is unacceptable. Uh, when you come in with mental health illnesses, we should have the staff doing the inspections. When someone uh, is uh, died from suicide, they look and see and conduct an investigation to determine uh, if someone did not carry out their role to make sure that post was inspection, inspected. There's a thorough investigation. Also, remember, there was a law passed. The Attorney General uh, has an obligation to investigate this. And she's thorough in investigation as well as the investigation that's come from the, from the facility. 1,400 since January have returned to work. 1,400. Those that are still out, if they're out for legitimate reasons, we are going to make sure to receive the necessary medical care that they deserve. If you are attacked in your home because of that, then we're not going to demonize you because you did your job. That is just not right. Those who are not following the rules and procedures, they will be held accountable. And that is part of what the commission is doing. But let's not, let's not overlook the fact, since January, 1,400 have returned back to work. And the city council, made the decision they did not want any new correction officers. That was part of the process in the budget. How many, how many, uh, how many correction officers have quit since January? Have, have, have quit, uh, have retired? You have a number? Okay. Um, approximately, I would say, between retirements and resignations, approximately 500. 
you're saying uh, you're saying that the city council, Mr. Mayor, did not authorize additional officers. Do you think they should have hired additional officers? And Mr. Molina, do you believe you need additional officers? Uh, I, uh, yes, I think that uh, when you look at <clears throat> uh, what these officers are going through, uh, doing triples. Uh, uh, the uh, what we want to do when it comes down to those dangerous inmates. There's a portion of people who are here that they want to serve their time. They want to go home. But you have a portion of inmates that are dealing with real mental health uh, illnesses. Some of them are just extremely dangerous. And if we can't properly separate that population and properly make sure they have the right supervision, then that can create a dangerous environment. So I personally believe uh, we should have increased the numbers that the commissioner stated he needed, but there's a negotiation that takes place with the city council, and we're willing to negotiate, but even without, we are not going to give up in ensuring that the location is safe. How Mr. many officers, as a follow-up, uh, Mr. Molina, how many additional officers do you think that you need to make Rikers safe? Well, I believe that the, the, the number of officers that we had asked for um, that number was a little over 550, was what we needed to advance a lot of other progressive strategies that we wanted to do to manage the people in our population. Okay. Because we, hold on, because this is so important, because idealism collides with realism. The commissioner comes in and he states, here's some creative things we want to do, like the Peace Center. Here's some creative things we want to do so we can start allowing those who are here to go and become productive citizens. But in order to do that, you have to have offices to make sure that this environment is safe. So if we, on one end, we have the I idealism of saying, we want you to do something different with the inmates, but on the other end, you can't have more offices to make sure that they're safe in, in, in the environment. So they're actually hurting some of the initiatives that Commissioner Molina is trying to do to create the release of inmates so they'd be prepared to be active citizens. They think they are hurting uh, law enforcement by saying no new offices, but no, you're hurting what you're actually, actually saying you want this commission to accomplish. Uh, Mayor Adams and, and for you, Commissioner Molina, um, it had been reported that the, there's been a delay, I believe, in transferring um, OBC from DOC to DCAS. Um, you, you understand, you, you know the, uh, the letters mean. Can you talk a little bit more about that, that, that plan, why there is a delay, and any more on the, the renewal Rikers plan and, and the future of the island here? Yeah, so the, there's not a delay. Uh, we are not in a position to transfer OBCC to DCAS. Um, population estimates that were made under the prior administration that we would only have 4,000 or less people in custody have not borne out. We have had an average daily population of approximately 5,500 people. Today our census is about a little over 5,600. So it would not be um, logical for us to have a facility and transfer it over to DCAS when there's a possibility that in the future we may need that capacity. I know we have budget cuts, but can I have some water? <laughs> Thank you. I have a question for the commissioner. Can you tell us the number of correction officers that are still refusing to come back to work, not because of any illness, or injury, and what measures do you have to bring them back to work? So we have a number of measures. We have a health management division that monitors people that are out sick. Um, we have, um, I would say that the number of people that are out sick has reduced significantly from where we were last year. That reduction has been over 40%. How many are there if out now? I would now? say a, a number of people that were out sick today is somewhere around 900. Today, today. Nine, 900? Yes. We're out sick. And yeah. that's 40% less than? Yeah, it's more than 40% less of what it was last summer, when I believe it was over 2,000. And, 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 and refusing to come to work is different from you can't work at this time. You have to be clear on that. But they're out sick, you're saying. Yeah. But you don't. Well, I mean, a, a doctor is made, making a medical decision that this person is unavailable to come to work for medical reasons. Um, and we have a health management division that reviews these charts and in many cases concurs with this individual's injuries. Nolan? Yeah. And that, hold on, Nolan. Because this is a misnomer that every correction officer that is sick is faking. That's not true. Some of these officers have been assaulted. Some of them have legitimate issues from COVID. Uh, some of them are sick. People get sick. 
And so this misnomer that, okay, if the correction officer is home sick, he doesn't want to come to work. No, people get sick. People get assaulted. This is not, this is a job where you are assaulted. And so what the commissioner has done, he has sent out a clear message. That's how we got the 1400 back. If you are faking sick, that's not acceptable. But if a doctor is saying this person can't come into work, we're not gonna allow an officer to come into work that legitimately can't. And I don't think that's the message that has been clearly sent. People automatically believe because they are sick, they are faking being sick. That's just not a reality. This is a, this is a dangerous job where there's a lot of assaults, where people are dealing with some serious medical uh, issues. No one? Uh, I was wondering if you could break down those statistics a little bit more. Of the 900, approximately how many of them will have their cases reviewed by the medical board? And how many of those reviews actually confirm what they're telling you, that they are actually properly out sick? So we can follow up with you with, with some numbers if you like. Um, I don't know if those numbers off the top of my head from memory. I mean, the number changes every day. There are individuals that may not feel well for a couple of days, like in any other job, and they call in sick. And there are others that have other long-standing um, medical issues that we're ongoing and evaluating to determine their fitness for duty. So, um, and we also must remind ourselves that we've just gone through a global pandemic and the uniformed staff and the non-uniformed staff that work here didn't have the luxury of teleworking from home in order to manage this very volatile and uh, violent population. Do you have an estimate of how many people are actually properly sick versus those who are faking it? So I don't have any evidence that right now that anybody's faking it. Have, we have do medical um, doctors that are deeming individuals that are sick, so. Hold on, hold on, Because this is really interesting. This is the only occupation where we're asking, hey, are your, are your members faking sick? We're not asking for anyone else. We're not asking NYPD. We're not asking H&H. &H, we're not asking uh, school teachers. We're not, we're not asking anywhere else. The only place that we're asking, hey, your members are faking. <laughs> I mean, that's not a pattern to you. Something's not wrong with that. The most dangerous law enforcement job, the question we're asking is that, are your members faking? I have never heard that ask of any other city employee. But we're asking the men and women from the Department of Correction. The previous administration oh, charged no, 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 Mr. Mayor, I apologize. The previous yeah. administration alleged that COBA had engaged in a sick out. Mm -hmm. hence, hence the question. Do you disagree with that assessment? Yes, I think, I think the previous administration on every level did not support the Department of Correction. They, and some of the comments I heard from previous administrations of uh, what these men and women represent I thought it was not a true account of these men and women. And I believe that if someone does a sick out, uh, I know for years these officers have been saying this place is dangerous. They've been saying it for years. This place is a place that's about to blow up. For years they've been saying that. And I don't think previous administrations have acknowledged what these officers have been saying. But even if they did do a sick out then, we should not be asking the question of them that we have not asked of others. Are y'all faking being sick? That's, this is the only city agency where that question is being raised. Oh, oh no, no, no. <laughs> you get, they're gonna come to you in a moment, so you'll be all right. <laughs> Commissioner, do you have a daily average? For the hold on, hold on, let us, let us, let us, go ahead. Do you have a daily average for the number of officers that are out sick? Uh, a daily average, we can get it to you, but I would say it's around 900 a day, so that number has started to creep down under 1,000 from where it was last summer, which was significantly over 2,000. Mark. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, just off topic no, on no, the uh, red we'll, guideline. We'll, we'll come back. We don't, do, we don't do off topic. Chris, man. You know we don't like people sitting behind. That's why y'all shooting at me. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we reported yesterday that the DOC didn't count the death of uh, Antonio Bradley, an inmate who died after hanging himself in a Bronx holding cell. He was not counted because he was released on compassionate release while he was in a coma from that hanging attempt. Do you agree with that decision not to count him as an inmate to death, or do you think that's almost has a hallmark of cover-up? He, he, he died inside 
He died inside the facility? He died at a hospital after hanging himself in a holding cell. He was not counted as an inmate death because he was, quote unquote, released on compassionate release while in a coma. Okay, he, he, if what I was told from my days of policing when a person died is how you're supposed to record it. And if, if that's a violation of a law or rule, we'll correct that. But if, from what I, my understanding, if, if I got someone on the street that was still alive and they were shot, they were still alive and he died in the hospital, that's what you count to, when he died. So I don't see that as a, as a cover up or a violation of any rule. If it is, we would definitely correct it. But my understanding is the place of death is where a person died. But just from, from your own point of view, do you think that's the proper way of counting it? The, he hung himself while he was in custody mm -hmm. and then he died when he was quote unquote not in custody because he was released on compassionate release. Do you think that's a reasonable way of counting a death? Uh, yes, a person could be shot on uh, Bedford Avenue but die in the hospital. You account where they die. And so if, there's a, if, there, if that violates some rule, we will correct that. It won't happen. But until then, of my understanding, that is when you account the place of death. I don't think people are trying to distort or change the numbers because the numbers are what they are. If someone uh, dies in the facility, the commissioners are going to try to cover up. The numbers are what they are. And that's what we feel. Just let the numbers be reported. If we have X number of suicides, those are the numbers. There's no reason trying to hide it. You know and I know you can't hide from the press. So what they are, what they are. He died in the hospital. That is what the numbers are. Last on topic, Eric. Oh, uh, I didn't, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't actually have one, but I kind of do. Um, all right, you had 1,400. Can you just clarify these numbers? Because you said 1,400 people came back to work. But then you said 900 is down by 40%, um, which that does not, can you just sort of clarify because I don't think those numbers add up. And then are, are, are you saying that it's your position at this point that everyone who is out sick, that that is uh, legitimate in, in all of those cases and you're not seeking to enforce anymore the way the past administration was, um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, potential abuses? No, you want to talk sure, about sure. So, um, one is we could follow for sure and get you the exact numbers of where we were at this time last year of the number of people that were out sick, uh, where we have been today. Um, I can tell you that that decline has been over 40%. And individually and totally, when we count officers, captains in various ranks, over 1,400 people have come back to work. But the majority of that has been officers. And I've also signed off on nearly 1,000 disciplinary cases. In some of those cases, it was abuse of sick leave. So we will hold people accountable if we suspect that there's some level of medical incompetency taking place. We will take action against that individual. But that is not the majority of the people that are out sick. We're we, we clear, Aaron. We're clear. It's because I don't want this to be distorted. We're not saying everyone that's out sick um, has a legitimate reason for being out sick. But we're also not saying that everyone that's out sick is faking being sick. You know, in all agencies, you have a small number of people who are using and abuse the sick policy in every agency. We see it all the time. But the overwhelming number of city employees that are out sick, they are sick. And we would like to give them the benefit of the doubt until an investigation determines that they are abusing the process, as some are abusing the process. And that's what the commissioner is stating. They're doing a review on that to make the right determination. But the numbers have substan substantially dropped under the commissioner leadership. Just the number, commissioner, on the uniform workforce size? Uh, the uniform workforce size is about 7,000. Thank you. Can I do my off topic now for switching over? Well, ready for off topic? Off topic? Huh? Yes, 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 okay, hold on. We get, we, thank you, thank you. Good job. Good job. Yeah. Do a few up to up Oh, thank you. Um, just on the run guidelines board, could you just give me your thoughts on what happened last night? How you feel about how that translates into you know how we are as a as our economy right now? Well, you know, we heard of it, you know, we heard it at the beginning of the year, we were talking about up to 9% uh, 
uh, that was just really uh, just unacceptable in thought. And we continued to raise our voice to share what our concerns were. Uh, we saw the numbers go down to, uh, I believe it was 3% in, for one year, uh, 5% in, was it 5%? Was it right, for uh, additional years. Uh, look, system is broken. We had, we witnessed um, renters having to deal with uh, this uh, trauma of financial trauma, but we also saw those small property owners, 15 units, 16 units, nine units, uh, they're hurting, oil, water bill, taxes. So we had to find a medium. And what we wanted to do was also to use Albany as a way to put money back into renters pockets, pockets, earn income tax credit, um, child care vouchers. We knew that based on what the rent guideline, guidelines board was saying, that they was going to do an increase. So we had to find ways to put money back into the pockets of New Yorkers and not hurting uh, those uh, small property owners, which was my focus. And with all that, can you just talk about how much of a, uh, a strain that could be on people that are just struggling <coughs> as it is? It is a strain. It's a strain on struggling small property owners. It's a strain on renters. Uh, we are all experiencing a strain right now. And so what I must do is find ways to alleviate uh, that strain. And like what we're doing around uh, how we're going to assist those small property owners and renters by utilizing our budget and utilizing uh, the funding that's coming from Albany to offset some of the score. This is a strain on all of us. All of us are under, under strain. And this is a major uh, concern for renters, and I respect that, you know, that this is a concern for them. Morgan? Um, Mayor, I'm hoping you could speak about the transit officer who was attacked yesterday on his first solo patrol. I know you were talking about changing the rules a little bit. I was hoping you could go into detail. And if you're concerned at all about maybe the trend, I mean, this was the second day, are you going to maybe stop the solo patrols altogether or just make these fixes, like you were saying? First of all, uh, to that hero officer, I thank him for service. I thank God that um, he's okay and the bad guy's in jail, a person who has a history of assault. Uh, and I take my hat up to the commissioner. Uh, as soon as the incident happened, she reached out to me. I had a conversation with uh, the president of the DEA. I had a conversation with uh, Patty Lynch. And, you know, the conversation was really, how do we reach the goal that we want? How do we get the omnipresence? And how do we make sure that our officers are safe? And we uh, came with a real meeting of the mind of let's have the separated solo patrol stay in eyesight of each other. Uh, this would allow the immediate backup with the communications that we currently have. And I think there's something that many people are missing. Uh, I can talk with my union guys. <laughs> you know, Patty and I spoke last night around uh, 10, 10. 10 o'clock at night. Uh, the DA, DA president, uh, Joe and I spoke late at night. These guys say that Eric is the support of law enforcement and he's willing to listen. And the police commission, I spoke with them late last night, and we immediately said, you know what, we have to adjust. We're not going to, going to be so rigid that we're not going to adjust to accomplish the task that we need. And I, I thank Patty, I thank Joe, and I thank the police commissioner for doing so. And I'll, most important, I thank that officer. Steve, just to follow up on that, um, it, it, you talked yesterday about the deployment strategy of having one officer get on the last car of the train, the other officer get on the front. That can't happen anymore. Doesn't this defeat a lot of the purpose of doing solo patrols? No, we, we want to stay in eye distance, and you can accomplish that on eye distance. If that officer uses just uh, tactically, if that officer is on the two train and they're three cars apart, they can physically see each other through that door as they move through the train. It's important to keep moving through the train to engage with passengers and to see any conditions that, that needs to be corrected. And if I can follow up on, on a separate topic real quick. I saw the report that there have been zero enforcement actions on the employer vaccination mandate since you took office. Just, you know, what, what is the purpose of having this rule still in place if there's no effort at enforcement whatsoever? We always said we didn't want to uh, um, penalize, we wanted to educate. It has been winning. Our numbers are dropping. Our numbers are increasing for people going back to work. Our economy is moving forward. I had a duality here. I wanted to do the right things so we don't spin backwards in COVID. 
But at the same time, I wanted my, our economy to come back. That's crucial. And we have been successful in doing so. The numbers are showing that uh, the strategy we put in place is a winning strategy. Uh, we did not have to be heavy handed. I met with my business leaders often. We had conversations around this is what we need to do, safe so social distancing, um, put masks on. So we didn't have to go in and penalize. We had to continue the conversation. And, and we are, we're winning. We are successfully navigating COVID. Today we announced uh, the vaccine under five years old. I'm just really pleased on what the team has done around COVID. Eric. Um, Mr. Mayor, your financial disclosure form that was released today um, says that you still own a uh, half of uh, the co-op apartment on Prospect Place. Um, which you said during the campaign that you had uh, transferred ownership of that to, to the friends that you co-owned it with. Um, so can you clarify what is the status of that property? Do you in fact still own it? And why is there a discrepancy between those two reports? Yeah, that, uh, yes, still own it. And I, I think, did you send out that release to everybody? I said, I mean, you get a copy, you get a copy of that? Well, we, we all did, yeah. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> we need to release it. Another the question, speak with them. We sent out a release, we explained it all. Uh, you, you, you guys know I'm not gonna go over and over and over and over again the same thing. He crafted a release. We're sending to whoever, whoever didn't get it. He'll please raise your hand and he'll make sure you get it. We didn't get it. Yeah. We okay. He's gonna make sure you get it. My my comment on it. Yeah, yes. Yeah. No. So, Mr. Mayor, why did you sign a letter saying that you transferred the shares in the first place if the transfer didn't take place? Okay. He's gonna give you the release, and then you can he'll answer any question after that if you have any other misunderstanding. Okay. Okay. He'll make sure you get it. He'll make sure you get it. Because you told could you, you told my colleagues that you had sold it. There's some issue. I mean, um, uh, did you? We also don't have our have? phones. We're not on the internet right now, Guys, so we can't. Yeah, see we don't have our phones. We'll give it to you right after. No, I'll come. show it to you. I'll show it to you right don't, don't say no, 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 Lynn. Don't say no. This is not your press conference. It's mine. I answered the question, and I'm not going to go back and forth. So don't say no, like you're controlling my press conference. Well, Mr. Mayor, I'm not going to I already told you. Get it from, uh, get it from, um, from Fabian. It's, it's a silly question. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Yes, Mayor. Yes, yes. Yesterday, you said that in the uh, taxi accident that the uh, bicyclist ran the red lights. Mm -hmm. Are you planning to do anything about enforcing rules for bicyclists because this driver has been vilified and uh, he apparently had the light, I don't know all the particulars, but even in the police report it said that the bicyclist ran the red light. Yes, we are deeply looking at traffic enforcement that includes scooters, bicyclists, and cars, because everyone share the road. And so we are sending a very clear message that I'm a bicyclist, I follow the rules. We want everyone to follow the rule. And anyone who has been a critic of having bicyclists follow the rule, they need to look at the video to see that that, what appears to be going through the red light, caused some of the actions that took place. So everyone must follow the rule and we're going to enforce it equally. Thank you all. Just want to ask one more thing about solo patrols, uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes. The PBA president said from the beginning that he thought it was a bad idea to have solo patrols. Now an officer has been injured as a result of that. I'm just wondering what, what made you change your mind specifically? Was it this incident last night that you saw that you realized your initial rollout of the policy was flawed? Can you let us know a little bit what changed your no, mind? No, no. Um, I am not rigid, and I'm not a person that can't communicate. Uh, I communicate with my presidents of the PBA, of the DEA, of the LBA. Of, I talk to everyone. And after the incident that happened last night, and I communicated with the commissioner, I said, let's continue to evolve. I said this when we spoke yesterday. We're going to continue to evolve our transit safety plan. And I think nothing is worse than a person that believes they have to be so rigid that they're not willing to see how to build a better mousetrap. That's what I'm going to do. I have two goals. One, omnipresent. We still have that. Number two, to make sure our offices are safe as possible.